Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our webinar. And today we're going to be talking about the EACOE, the Enterprise Architecture Center of Excellence, the Enterprise Architecture Standard. And uh, I'm here to sell you all sorts of things today because, as we all know, we're dealing with complexity in the real world. And what is your baseline for addressing and managing orders of magnitude increases in complexity and orders of magnitude increases in demand and change? Yes, I'm sounding like a hype meister on purpose here, as we'll see as we go through the presentation, because this is what you're facing uh, every day that's there. And all we got to do here, of course, all you got to do here is draw one simple diagram on an 8.5 by 11 piece of paper, and all we know is that this is going to do it. And this is the standard, of course, that we see out there. Well, just make sure that everyone understands we can actually use a bunch of tools. That's going to help us out to make this thing look a little prettier. All we got to do, and we got different colors, and we got different squares, and we got different lines and things like that. And of course, you know, I don't need any of this stuff. Our enterprise is very simple. All I need is a high level of detail. Just think about that phrase for a moment. High level of detail? What does that mean? I don't even know what it means. I just need a conceptual view of what's going on. And of course, this is our current state, and we want to get to this state, which is our future state. How tough could this be? Any questions about this? No, let's go off and march off to that hill. We're going to take that hill out there. Well, actually, you know, what we need here is an understanding of a flow of information, and that will get us to that particular point that's there. Now, just to make sure everyone understands the current state of situations, this is a simplified diagram of the environment that we're dealing with right now. And, of course, as you can see here, we've got this wonderful legend on the bottom, so there should be no issues at all with anybody understanding anything that is going on here. Any questions? Well, of course not. Let's go on and write some more code and figure out what's happening here. Well, as you said, you wanted to have everything on one 8.5 by 11 PowerPoint slide, so that's what we've done for you. We've taken our whole environment, and as you can see here, it's kind of simple. Oh, you need some color to make this a little bit easier to understand? Well, that's not a problem at all. So we just overlaid all the different activities on there to give you a better understanding of what's going on. Again, any questions? Of course, we can see what's happening in here. Now, just just make sure that we understand here. There's two things that we want to understand. The strategic end goals or the strategic intent that we have, and of course the tactical activities you know, that are going on here. Uh, any, any questions about this diagram? Well, of course, what we need to do, and I know that you're uninitiated, you're just a bunch of business users, but I got to explain this to you anyways. So we have all these layers in this. I know this is too complicated for you to understand because you're just a bunch of users of our stuff because you know what users are versus customer. You guys are just users. But if you want me to explain this to you, I'll be more than happy to. Now, as you can see, the complexity that we're dealing with to handle your stuff, I mean, you can see how difficult our universe is, you know, that's out there. You know, I don't need any of these drawings. I don't need any of these silly pictures. I'm a real hard-nosed guy. I just have to make sure I understand what that thing is doing, and I can, I can just go in there and fix anything that you want here, because I know exactly what's going on in this particular environment. So you told me, and so what I need to do is to change the blue wire. You know, that blue wire right there. Can't, you know, that blue wire right there. Well, let me give you a, a better shot of this. You know, that blue wire. Is that blue wire? We've got to change that blue wire. It's still not good enough. You need more detail? Well, that's no problem at all. We've got to change that blue wire. We've got to change it to yellow. Any questions? Now, I hope that was just a little bit silly for you, but kind of serious. But as we all know, all we need is a tool to address this stuff, and we'll be all set. So we've got a tool. Isn't this a great tool that you see here? This will do anything, anything in the world. It's just incredible how many different things it's going to do here. 
oh, let's say that we want to, uh, let me see here. I, I want to open a bottle of wine because, you know, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the, the technology folks here. And, you know, you've really, really pressed, you know, the, the world, uh, you know, on me quite a bit here. So you notice I got this little tool in here. I can just use this tool in this multi thing. You know, it, you, know you told me that you need various things out there. But all I need, all I need is this thing here. Well, you know, it's, uh, I'm sorry about that. I know that you had that very, very nice bottle of wine. And I, I uh, geez, I messed up the cork. I, I'm, I'm sorry. So what I'm going to do here um, on our version two of this is I'm going to go out to Wikipedia and figure out what, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that's the source of all wisdom. We know that. So we're going to see what's out there. Uh, boy, that, uh, that gave me some hints. And uh, so I'm going to go to essentially my favorite popularity contest engine called Gagging and see if I can actually find out what's happening out there. You know, maybe I should look at, I know where I'm going to look. It's where all the professional people hang out. You know, it's called Unhinged. That's the site that has all the professionals out there. And they're going to essentially tell me what, what's happening out there. And, you know, I've got all of these friends. I actually haven't met any of these friends out there, but everybody tells me they're friends. So I'm going to go to Faceless Book and ask a bunch of my friends that I've never seen before. I have really no idea who they are, but I'm going to ask them about what I should do about opening a bot you know, bottle of wine that's out there. And you know what they did? They pointed me to Instabrag. And Instabrag has, of course, a bunch of pictures, and it said this is the most popular thing out there. There's no doubt about it. This is going to solve all your wine problems that, that, that you're going to need there. Uh, let me see if there's anywhere I can find these things. So I go to pin the tail out site and I see essentially that this of course is the most popular thing in the universe that's out there. And just to make sure I'm doing the right thing, I go to essentially the bird dropping site and ask a bunch of other people about this thing. And everybody assured me that this is the greatest thing in the world. So you know what I do? I actually go out and talk to somebody that really knows about this, a certified sommelier. And that person says, no, 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 no. I don't care what's on these sites. This is going to mess up your wine cork because the screw is too big. It's too thick. Yeah, this is good if the wine was made a month and a half ago. But if you're looking for a really good quality wine, it's not a price issue. It's a vintage issue and things like that. You're, you're going to mess this thing up. This is not the right, but this is the most popular thing out there. Everybody is using it. Well, you know what? Everybody is everybody. But what we actually need is something like this. And the reason for it is this particular device, which is the key to it, is essentially built for one purpose. And that's making sure that it goes easily into the cork that's there and when you actually use the lever to make sure that the cork comes out completely. Because it has been engineered, engineered for that particular purpose. And oh, by the way, we know it's not going to last forever. So we have the ability to change this because we have the concepts of assemble to order, and we can change this thing after it is aged a little bit and used, and we can essentially make sure that it's working again. Well, you know, this is all good stuff, but I'm, you know, this is what I got here. And, and you, know, uh, you know, I hear all that stuff, but now, you know, um, I've got to modify uh, the porch on my house here for a second. You know, just notice again, Sam, we have this wonderful saw here. That's all we need. You know, and I, you know, I understand all that stuff that's out there. You know, just, just give me a break. I, you know, that, that wine stuff. But this is what I, I got to build real stuff here. I got to get the code out the door. I got to build real stuff out there in the world that you're seeing. And this is, this is what I'm going to use here. Well, you know, job's a little bit bigger than I thought here. So what I'm going to do, essentially, is I'm going to go to the next, you know, this is all I need. You know, it's $1.59. Everybody's using this thing. This is really all I need to make this thing happen. Everybody knows that. And that's all I, we need here. Notice, that, you know, I just got to buy another tool. You know, maybe I need some help there. I need some power tools to be able to do that. And so what I'm going to do here now is really go into another level of sophistication in this particular tool area here. And I'm going to get this all-encompassing 
do-all circular saw and this battery-operated thing. I can, it's portable and everything else like that. And, geez, you know, I just use this thing, and uh, it stalls out all the time here. I don't, I don't get it. I, you know, it just, it says it can do everything. That's what the vendor literature said. It can do anything. It can build anything that you want here. And uh, essentially, eventually, I end up with, oh, my God, look at this thing. You know, this thing's got a quarter. I can't believe it's got this is the power tool. This is all I got to do. I just got to buy this thing, and I can build anything I want here. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you know what can happen with something like this or the other tools there? Three things. Number one, you can generate a lot of sawdust. Number two, you can really hurt yourself. And number three, you may be able to do something useful. And that's what you and I have been dealing with when it comes to enterprise architecture. So I hope you, I took that little 10 minutes of introduction and brought a little humor to this area because we all got to smile a little bit more about this. But this is really, really, really important. And what I want to do is to give you a little background as to what we have done in this field for quite a long time. And we break it up into five components. One is a little bit of history of who we are. Who actually are we out there? The process for building essentially an enterprise architecture. It is not a general encyclopedia of all the possible things in the universe that somebody may consider when they hear that phrase, because that's not a methodology. That's just a file cabinet full of stuff, whatever is out there. It doesn't give you a path. If I know the ingredients for something, it still isn't enough. How do you actually bake a cake? And how do you know that that cake is going to be good? Well, give me a path, and then I can go in and do the variations. There is a frame of reference. Every profession that you and I know about have this many frames of references. That is one of the most confusing concepts that we see out there. Now, what is examples of frame of reference? Well, the frame of reference that you and I are using right now is the English alphabet, 26 letters of the alphabet. You can't roll your own. In music, there's the notes in music. Can you imagine for just a moment that the percussion section has a different frame of reference than the uh, string section, um, uh, you know, than, uh, as in the wind instruments? You know, you can't have an orchestra. Every profession has this many frames of references that are out there. And now, once we have that background, we can talk about the tools that are available to you for essentially building an enterprise architecture. And those tools have been built not like this in a Swiss Army knife, but for a specific purpose, an integrated, not interfaced, an integrated environment to make sure that coming out of the gate as best we can to assist you in actually having a beginning and a middle and an end product, which is an enterprise architecture that enables your business strategy. That's what this is about. And finally, we end the presentation with essentially a, a number of things that we offer the people that work with us in the field that's out there. So who are we? We began in 1972, yes, that's the correct date, 1972, as computer and engineering consultants. And I was an engineer by background, and I was looking in the world of information systems, and I was just startled at how young it was. Uh, IT is not that old. Information technology isn't that old. And oh, by the way, the olden days, we used to be called data processing. Now we're called information technology. What are we doing today? Processing data that's out there. And from that, we actually formed a group called the Pinnacle Business Group, which handles our consulting work and our topic of today, which is enterprise architecture. We have a sister organization for business architecture. And then the last one is the other side of the brain, the soft skills that you and I need for architecture that's there. How do you actually present this information? How do you talk to individuals? How do you facilitate things like this? It's the other side of the brain. It's the soft skills that's there. And all, we're all uncomfortable with, with that side of the business. I, I understand that, you know, that's out there. 
And we had a tremendous number of people that we worked on early on and today to move along there. The first thing we recognized is there's three dimensions to this particular activity. There's the business side, understanding the business and how it's evolving, the information or the technology side, which a lot of you probably are, are, are most familiar with, and we understand that, you know, it's out there. And then the organization, the human side, because whether we like it or not, organizations are made up of human beings. Once we understood this, and we named it decades ago, decades ago, bioengineering, and we took the word engineering on purpose because we believe there is science behind all of this. And that's been the basis of our methodology and our process. And then we looked at that and said, if we have these three dimensions, what are the required understandings that are there? The first is language, linguistics. Essentially, what are we looking at? In other words, how do we actually take this stuff and make it human consumable? I want to emphasize that phrase, human consumable. We're not talking to compilers. We're talking to human beings. So why don't we go out and figure what that, what that is? And that involves essentially language, organizational and human dynamics. How do you get people to adopt these things? Because there's always resistance to change. This is a natural con condition that we have out there. We have to understand the concepts of complexity. Complexity. This is dealing with 100-story buildings, not log cabins. This is b b dealing with massive bridges over ravines, not rope bridges across um, you know, a, a trail that's out there. There's different activities. Building a 100-story building is very different than building a log cabin. And oh, by the way, you can't take 100, st uh, 100 log cabins and pile them on top of each other to get a 100-story building. It's not going to happen. Very different concepts. You can't evolve into these types of things that are out there. And then it comes to essentially the group think and thinking activities. In other words, there's this horde mentality that sometimes occurs, and I call it analysis through fatigue rather than analysis by analysis. It's out there. And when you hear the phrase, can you live with this, that should be an antenna that says, wait a minute, what do you mean? Li no, I can't live with this thing. It's either yes or no. Sort of is a problem. You know, I sort of want you to build a big building. Well, how big do you want it? Ah, why don't you get started and I'll tell you, uh, you know, when, when you get there. It's, it's not going to work. You know, it's out there. And then essentially, well, how do you actually mechanize all this? How do you make it easier? How do you put all these tools in the hands of people and which ones are there? But that's the last step. That's the last step. Once you understand how to do it manually, then you can apply essentially mechanical skills that are out there. And from that, we said, well, how do we approach this very new area in the early 70s? Well, first of all, we had to have a holistic view. And it turns out that we can have essentially a lot of understanding about that. And there's actually four components to this. One is the concept of a framework, frame of reference, which is different than the concept of a process or a methodology. And then the two things we had to understand was our two audiences essentially the human audience and the implementation audience. Where's that coming from? In the physical world, we have engineering and we have manufacturing. Those two are quite there, quite similar types of things that are looking at. The other thing was the phrase that we call minimum business intrusion. We don't believe that our business people, your business people, want to watch sausage being made. They just want the sausage that's there. And this is another design objective. And finally, essentially, full guidance. In order to make this happen, the whole thing had to be put together. Tools, techniques, processes, methods, work breakdown structures, project plans, templates, as much of this, not rigor mortis, but essentially available to get people going and have a pattern to look at. It needs to be teachable. One person can't do this on their own, especially in large organizations. It has to be repeatable. The process has to be repeatable to produce essentially guidance in a consistent manner. And finally, as a professional services firm, the concept of fixed fee-based outcomes, not time and material where you don't know where the end is. Here's the process, here's the deliverables, and here's the cost in a fixed fee, fixed time basis that's there. 
And so there were influencers and advisors and domain experts in each one of these. And then the linguics, uh, linguistics area, a couple of very famous linguists that we have the privilege and pleasure of working with and had the privilege and pleasure of working with out there. Organizational human dynamics, understanding how to communicate with human beings. Daryl Connor, first one that told us in the early 70s, don't start projects with a blank sheet of paper and going out and interviewing people. It's called a top of mind understanding. It's the worst possible way to do things. And we said, Darrell, what are you talking about? Everybody does this. He says, I'm telling you, we've been studying this for a long time. This is the worst possible way to do things. We took his advice, Don Harrison, organizational and human dynamics, the understanding of complexity, the understanding of groupthink. These are all experts. Who's B.W. Tuckman? I'm sure you've heard this phrase. Forming, storming, norming, performing. That's who invented these things, you know, that are out there. And again, we had the privilege and pleasure of working with these organic people, not through the internet. We didn't have the internet, thank goodness, by the way. What we had was human communication. And by the way, it cost money. Best practices do not exist on the internet. Those are published practices. Best practices, real good stuff that produces good results, cost money. And you know who recognized that just a little while ago? A young lady named Taylor Swift. Do you remember back when Tim Cook at Apple announced Apple Music? And he says, ladies and gentlemen, we've got this great deal for you. We're going to give you all this music for 90 days for free. Aren't we a wonderful company? And Taylor Swift wrote an email that evening to Tim Cook and says, time out, Mr. Cook. Let me explain. And he, she did it very nicely. And she said, let me explain something to you. Do you know what you're giving away? You're giving away our intellectual property. It's not your property. You provide the pipe. It's our property that you're giving away. And the low closing line of her email to me is a classic. She says to Mr. Cook, we don't ask you for free iPhones. Please don't ask us to provide our music to you for free either. What a great line. And that's what we have to recognize about the internet. All of you have subscriptions to various things. That should give us a trigger where the good stuff is. There's a difference. And if you're getting stuff from free, you know, I know you know this, that you're the one being sold. And that's the influencing that we have to be careful of. And finally, in the area of technical information and systems mechanization, and by the way, it started off with a gentleman named Dr. Daniel Tykro and his graduate student, Ernest Allen Hershey, out of the University of Michigan, who developed this concept of PSL-PSA, Problem Statement Language, Problem Statement Analyzer, which was the first descriptive language to try to describe business understanding well before mechanization. These are the early roots of these types of things. Dr. James Martin and Dr. Carmen McClure, Dr. Martin, Jim wrote one of the most influential books to me called Information Engineering, bringing engineering discipline to the information engineering side that's there. Of course, John Zachman, seminal work in the concepts of frames of references. His co-author in some of the papers, John Soa, and his, their bosses, so to speak, P. Duane James Dewey Walker, that began all of this with essentially a publication called business systems planning that's out there. And yes, we still have one of these. I have to be very careful because it came from the Smithsonian and, and they may be upset if I, if I uh, destroy it. I'm just joking about that. And finally, Dr. Robert Holland. These are influencers that we worked with. And just quickly here, we're at what we call essentially EA 3.0. And EA 1.0 began in 1966. Dewey Walker and his team developed information, business systems planning that's out there, understanding the enterprise through the eyes of building information systems. EA 2.0, some people use the phrase, please notice that I just smiled, okay, the word, is, this EA was hijacked by the IT organization that's out there, and this concept of the BAIT model, business application information and technology. And that came from a gentleman, uh, Dr. Stephen Spiewak, and unfortunately, Steve is no longer with us. He passed away a, a number of years ago. 
And the engineering design objective that he had was essentially understanding what needs to be done before building information systems. And you can turn anything to anything. You know, and one of the things, of course, about the Internet, as I said before, is anybody can write anything about anything. And you can call anything anything, unfortunately, that's out there. And finally, we're at EA 3.0 right now, which is an information age concept. We are coming out of the industrial age into the information age and passing through the Internet age. This is a major shift going on, and you and I, congratulations, are going to work with our organizations to move us forward. It's the true enabler of business strategy. Focus on information versus Internet technology as the delivery mechanism. It's information. The Internet and the technology is a pipe. We've got to figure out what goes through the pipe. That's the key element that's there. Understanding the business through a series of human consumable representations. That's EA. Sometimes confused with EITA, which nobody likes to hear, but it's wonderful stuff, but it's different. What is EITA? Information Technology Architecture, which is what a lot of people actually build, which is good, but not EA that's there. This is our definition that we worked from to essentially build this practice. Enterprise architecture is explicitly describing an organization. There's some boundary condition through a set of independent, non-redundant artifacts. In other words, what's the minimum number of things that we need to understand an enterprise? Not helter-skelter that's out there. What's the minimum set? As the phrase goes, to do something hard is really easy. To do something easy is really, really hard, and it takes some thinking that's out there. You've got to think through this. I don't want 77 things if I don't need them. What's the minimum set of things? We call that the architectural elements. Then we define, essentially, the interrelationships that are out there for implementation. First set of definitions are engineering. Second set of definitions are manufacturing. Yes, there are two sets of representations. This is true in every field that we've studied. And as I said, the phrase that we use outside of IT is engineering and manufacturing. Here we use architecture and implementation. And out of that comes a series of initiatives and roadmaps. The models themselves are a means to an end. They're very, very useful. But the means to an end of enterprise architecture is a series of initiatives and roadmaps to understand the organization Another comma, unfortunately, communicate this understanding to stakeholders. The other thing we've added to that part of the definition is in less than 90 seconds. Because in the world that we're out there right now, where everybody's got an itchy thumb and itchy trigger finger, so to speak, we only have so much time. So you and I as architects have to figure out how to talk to people about this in less than 90 seconds to move the organization forward. The second definition is what I call an elevator pitch. And this comes essentially from a gentleman um, that has, we have the, had the privilege of working with for decades. His uh, most recent uh, job was he was the uh, United States Federal Chief Information Officer, and his name is Tony Scott, Anthony Scott, that's out there. And one day as we were sitting in his office, he sort of, you know, sort of said, you know, this is what I think it really is. Enterprise architecture illuminates how an organization and all of its members can achieve its objectives. What a great phrase. Through the creation of a series of engineered models, not Picasso or Rembrandt's, but engineered models, using that term, and project initiatives that can easily be understood by all the people associated with the organization that's out there. So that was essentially the definition that we're working from. So we put together essentially a series of representations and a quote methodology to be able to do that and the first thing we're looking at essentially is the modeling to provide an organization with the most flexible and agile actions that they have and these representations are referred to in the science as ontological models not essentially hierarchies which are implementation models so the first part of our methodology is, defin is, is understanding these elements that we need to understand what is going on. And there are six of them. You know what they are? You know what they are. What, how, where, who, when, and why. Now, if there's a, those are called interrogatives. If there's a seventh interrogative, somebody's going to get a Nobel Prize. And when that happens, give me a call, and we'll change essentially what's out there. There are seven 
excuse me, six interrogatives that are out there. That's it. Well, what the heck are we doing today? That's a great question because there is no solid frame of reference. There was not a series of understandings before people went into and started building all these wonderful things that are out there. And of course, complement that with a series of what we call implementation models. And so from a standpoint of architecture, there are four elements that we need to understand. What we call these things, it's about communication. We don't call them critical success factors or objectives or strategies or key performance indicators. We have to have a language and we'll call all these things goals. They are represented by an ontological representation, not a hierarchy. Then we have a naming convention for the instance of the thing we're trying to present, achieve 40% repeat business. And that could be looked at like a table of contents in a book. Let me emphasize, a table of contents in a book. And you know what's required after that? Content. And essentially, we have essentially a definition that has essentially all the elements to describe the particular elements that's there. We call these names here just that, a name model, which is woefully inadequate, especially in the English language, to understand anything. So those are the four components that we've been working on. And then we have a series of essentially understandings, which we call the implementation models that show the interrelationships. And this required a tremendous amount of study of what human beings can absorb. I want to stress again, what human beings can absorb. And you and I, as human beings, when it comes to things that are complex, it is rare to find somebody that can understand more than two things bound together for implementation. So when you see these representations out there that are full of color charts and all these arrows and things like that, they are essentially mind-numbing. We've got to take into account. We have to study your brain and my brain and what we as human beings can absorb. We call those the architectural models and implementation models for human consumption, not for compiler consumption. They're very different. And from that, we essentially build out from the architecture a series of enablements that involve three steps. First is building an implementation model. Then we go in and essentially develop the initiatives. They're not declared. If somebody says to me, implement an ERP system, that's already a declaration. You can't architect, you can, you can't architect the business. You can architect the implementation, which we call EITA, Enterprise Information Technology Architecture. But somebody's already decided what the enterprise architecture implementation is. But this is essentially an example of the components of an initiative that is developed through our methodology. Not declared, but developed and traceable and transparent. And finally, the last thing is the prioritization. And you and I have seen this for decades now. IT has to align with the business. IT has to align with the business. IT has to align with the business. You know what we're going to be doing here? This is IT aligning with the business, and we have essentially a series of business-aligned initiatives that we can see here. And from all of this comes a frame of reference. And I want to thank John Zachman for his pioneering work in this particular area. It is very, very important. And he's been working on this for a long, long time, since he was at IBM. And he's done a tremendous job of giving us a frame of reference that I personally believe will become the frame of reference for enterprises and enterprise architectures and other things eventually. But right now, we just have a lot of resistance because nobody wants to be constrained. This is not a constraint. This is a communication vehicle. Now, we call this the enterprise framework, not the enterprise architecture framework. And this is essentially our enablement, our variation, our enhancements to the baseline that Mr. Zachman gave us a number of decades ago. And from that, we've defined a series of architectures. What actually is enterprise architecture in relation to business architecture, in relation to process architecture, in relation to data architecture, and how about this one, logistics architecture? What is that, Sam? That has nothing to do with enterprises. Anybody doing cloud computing out there? I would sure have somebody that knows how to lay things out before I start putting in things in the cloud. Because as you all know, nothing is in the cloud. There's no such thing as something in the cloud. It's somewhere, and we've got to know where it is.
And what we essentially done here is to put together an integrated methodology that you saw there in a software-driven approach. We've taken this whole thing and not hey, taken a Swiss Army knife approach trying to understand all the cats and dogs, but a very specialized approach that says this is how you do this. And if you do this, you're going to be able to pull the cork out of the wine each time. Almost each time. We know that there may be failures out there. Nothing is 100%. But I want to get close to 99.99% as possible. So it aligns perfectly with our methodology. It is based on Excel. Why? Because Excel is human consumable. And by the way, for you and I as practitioners, it is essentially a series of refined actions that really help us out. And within that, we have not only our methodology, but a fully worked out example in that same context that's out there. Step-by-step -step guidance, three different versions essentially of the tool work, working activities, text-based, video-based, step-by-step video-based. No training is required outside of our methodology because it's a mirror of that. You don't have to buy any tools. You don't have to take any more tool practice. Once you know how to do the EACOE enterprise architecture methodology, this enables to do it, do it even faster. Nothing else needs to be purchased to essentially move forward. And all the architecture models are stored directly in the tool, fully traceable and transparent that's out there. And of course, the implementation models are also directly in stored, uh, stored in there and fully traceable for each one of the models you know, that are out there. And from that, our methodology drives, of course, the end product, which is a series of what? Initiatives. And those, again, are traceable and transparent. All of these steps are all integrated to make all of this happen. I want to, I want to emphasize the word integration, which is different than the word interfacing. And of course, coming out of this is essentially a series of prioritized initiatives based on the business drivers. What I want to do here for just a moment is to share with you, I'm going to share my desktop, and I'm going to show you this tool and just, just very quickly. So what we see here that you get as part of the EACOE methodology is, again, a fully integrated tool to help you out here. And you see some red markings in green. And the red markings essentially show you essentially the instructions. And as you see here, you see the word tutorial, which will walk through your activities. And of course, beginning a new project essentially makes sure that everything is cleaned out. You can start all over again. And one of the things about enterprise architecture is there are six different dimensions that can be optimized. And you can choose the direction that's there. If I was doing true enterprise architecture for the business, I would essentially make sure that I was enabling my business goals as quickly as possible. Not optimizing IT, for example, but optimizing my business goals. If I want to optimize my business processes in a system, that's a different dimension that's out there. And each one of these artifacts that we're talking about, the what, how, where, who, and why, are completely essentially put in this particular tool. And you can see the colorations. This is some of the embellishments. We've got about 60,000 lines of code that we have underneath Excel. We don't touch Excel. We put them underneath Excel to essentially make the thing look pretty and, of course, make it easier for people to understand. And, of course, the other thing we have is the concepts of relate. So what would be essentially the relationship between the goals that we're trying to develop and the processes? And if you're saying, geez, I wonder if there is a relationship between the goal of, of transporting uh, possessions and the process of essentially move around, I can press on that box and I can see essentially the architectural elements that are there so I can understand what is going on. That's the concept of full integration in the methodology, in the process, in the activities that we essentially have that's out there. And these are all the different relationship models that we have. And then we have essentially the activities about building 
essentially the initiatives, the move-ahead activities. And some people call initiatives capabilities. Some people call them focus areas. Some people call them projects. Some people call them programs. We use the phrase initiatives. Of course, there isn't a consistent language. And to do this, we have a series of mathematical sciences that we've used to give us a head start. We don't put our brain in neutral, but because the enterprise understanding is so large, we need a little bit of aid to do that. And the aid is called affinity analysis. And in other uh, webinars that we've done, we've gone into detail about what the mathematics are out there is. And basically, the end product here is a series of move ahead initiatives that we have essentially prioritized. And when we see this, we can see the prioritization that's there. Now, of course, this is all raw data that you're seeing here that business people can work with, business people can understand, of course, or technologists can take a look at this, in other words, the architect, and keep enhancing those things you know, as you, um, as you go along. So these tools are made for the practitioner, and that's what we call our whole practice for practitioners by practitioners. That's the whole emphasis you know, that we have here. So again, this is part of not our, our education alone, but the mechanization to get as much friction out as possible. The end objective is to have a glass of wine. How do I make this as easy as possible to get there? The end objective of enterprise architecture is a series of initiatives to make the job essentially of figuring out how to move the enterprise architect, the enterprise, excuse me, from its as is state to its desired state as quickly, effectively, and as efficiently, you know, as possible is, is, is what we're chatting about. And just for a moment now, I'm going to turn this presentation over to my colleague, Dana Bear, to show you uh, the latest addition that we have. When I say latest, this wasn't yesterday. But we've now essentially added um, a smartphone front end to this so that as you as the architect are working with your various business people, you can capture this information essentially in a dynamic manner once again, without business interruption that's there. And we call this thing computer-aided strategy enabler. And so essentially, this will feed essentially our other tools that are out there. So you can write and store the definitions of things as you're moving forward. And it, again, it comes with full guidance that's out there. So I'm going to turn the presentation to over to Dana for just a moment here. So she can um, essentially uh, give you a uh, quick demonstration of this little tool that we developed. Again, that's included in our training and our, in our workshop activities when you become certified by EACOE. Dana, you're all set? Okay. Can, can you hear me, Sam? Yes, I can, but I okay. can't see your, I can't see the tool. Okay. Hold on a second. Mm -hmm. because I didn't share it. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. How's that? All right, it's there. Okay. <laughs> so I'm I'm sharing you this directly from my phone itself. So you can see the opening screen and then the second screen says, this application helps you create a tangible action plan for your business idea. It also helps you share your thoughts with other team members. So when you're on the go and you can't stop thinking about enterprise architecture, you can put it right in your phone on this app. So you hit, let's get started. It's pretty easy. And it follows along the eco method methodology, um, exactly as Sam kind of pointed out. So in here I have a project that we use often in our examples is, is the story of Toy Story. So I'll show you a preloaded kind of example um, here. So you click on Toy Story, and you can see here all the architecture models that you might create, uh, why we are doing what we're doing, which are the goals, processes, materials, um, roles, locations, and events. So if you click on the first one, for example, why are we doing what we're doing, strategies and goals, you can see here it says the definition of what a goal is. Um, and then you can see the format that we like to use in our in our examples. 
um, goal name, stress the description, resulting in business value, and will be measured by measurements no later than time frame. So, okay, we are ready to write some goals. Click on begin writing goal definitions now. And here we have some now. So I have one again included here, provide transportation. As you can see here, all of the elements are already, are already populated. Um, in here, goal name, goal description, results, measurement, timeline. If you want to see it all put together, you can click on view your goal definition. Here you go. Here's it all put together. Um, say you need to edit it, it doesn't look good, you can go back um, and you can click edit. And you can type, you know, right in here if you need to. Um, and you can do the same thing, click Save, with all of the different architecture models. Say you're done, and now what? You have them in your phone, but you want them, you know, be able to put in our tool. You can export to Excel by just clicking on this button, and it'll click, you know, and you can type in, and it'll send you an Excel file directly to your email or whichever email you need uh, it to be sent to. Um, so I'm just going to go back here. Um, but again, here's the drop down. You can see all the different architecture models. So now we want to look at location. Um, again, here's the description, uh, what a location is, the template that we like to be using for each definition. And you can see here um, we have one called Claw Games. Um, again, this is Toy Story. Uh, you can view the definitions, Claw Games, classify places where the enterprise houses toy aliens. So, Pretty, pretty simple. It's not fancy looking, but it's pretty effective in, in how it works. If you want to add a new definition, just put the plus sign, enter the location name, and you can go from there. So um, this is included to anybody who is an ECO member. You get access to this. And um, again, it's for you to be able to do EA on the go um, or in a meeting. You know, if you're thinking of something, just type it in your phone. Nobody will notice. Uh, but it's uh, just to help you out. Another another tool that we want you to be able to use um, in, in your work. So um, that's all I have. I will okay. pass it over. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. All right. Should be. Okay. I should have uh, control again. Thank you, Dana. And again, you can see here. Um, as as a member of uh, the Enterprise Architecture Center of Elections, EA, EAC, we with our with our um, um, activities, we're looking for again a holistic view. The whole design objective, once again, of this whole area, is to make the mechanics as frictionless as possible. The second thing is to recognize that we are dealing with human beings in enterprise architecture, and human beings are different than compilers. And in studying our brains, we've figured out what we believe is the essence of how to get an understanding of the enterprise desired state or as is state. And this is just one of the parts of the tools here. And since we control the all whole environment, we have a fully integrated, integrated approach. It's there. It was the model that we followed when we started talking with and listening to Linus Turvalis. People talk about Linux all the time, and it's an open source. Well, it's sort of <laughs> open source. Linus, Linus Turvalis controls that environment, and that's why it tends to work pretty well. And this is what we have to recognize. And don't get me started on the hacking that's out there. Uh, that's a webinar coming up for us uh, and my radio show about the hacking and how to address this. It needs to be looked at a little bit different. It's because we keep writing code and not assembling code. Once again, a topic for a different discussion that's there. So Dana showed you essentially some uh, understandings on these other activities that we're looking at. In addition to that, we have a, a source resources available to our practitioners. We have essentially member reference guides that are out there. And in this particular presentation, we were talking about enterprise architecture. Okay, and our courseware that we have, whether it's public courses, whether it's on your site, we have a fully um, um, uh, self self paced version. We have a distance learning, which essentially is uh, remote live sessions uh, that's there. We have the self paced. 
Included once again in all of that is that course videos. Unfortunately, you have to see this face which was geared toward radio and not television. I apologize. But the whole courseware also is available to you and with all the other things that we have in a video format. So when you go back to your own organization, you can essentially look at things and say, what did he say about an architecture model? Or what about goals or things like that? And you can go back and look at it. And we also have essentially what we call uh, our methodology um, practitioner guide where every, we here we just talked about uh, enterprise architecture, but every one of those architectural elements has a description of what's going on, a suggested diagram all the way through from architecture through implementation, and how all of this is transformed. I want to emphasize the word transformation, not decomposition. If you ever have the pleasure of, of hearing John Zachman talk about these things, there's a number of, um, of, of emphasize that, that, that he has emphasis, and all of that goes back to the original work that he did and, and published in 1987. So again, what we did here was bring a practitioner's bent to all of this, and essentially that's why we essentially took the initial set of understandings and essentially enable that so people can sort of see what is what is going on again this is all part of the holistic things that we have uh, in enterprise architecture that's out there so how can you possibly learn more a uh, more if you're interested in this um, we have two sites uh, on uh, on our, our website one is the member access that requires essentially going through our course. I want to emphasize we do not sell tools. We do not sell these guides. I'm sorry, we just don't do that. People said you can make a lot more money selling tools and stuff like that. Well, let me say this, and you and I don't know each other, but basically um, I still want to sleep at night. And putting a tool in your hand, just think about this thing for a moment, okay? <laughs> Two out of three things you can do with this tool are pretty dangerous. And not that I want to protect you from yourself, but I want to give you essentially that whole environment that's there. The guest access site has essentially our public facing things uh, that, um, that you may want to look at. Our workshop schedule, we have the traditional classroom, we have the distance learning, we have the fully online option available, and you can look those up. We can come on site and, and, and essentially do all the things we were chatting here. Uh, now we put together an economical model with as few as five participants on your site uh, to get started on that. Um, if you want to hear more about my world and my thinking, um, I've got a radio show called the 2020s Enterprise with Sam Holzman. That's me on Voice America Radio. Uh, we are in week 12. Uh, this is a little bit of an experiment for me. I love it. And uh, I've been booked for 13 weeks, and then I've got to figure out what, uh, what I'm going to do. All of those previous um, episodes are on the website uh, that you can look at. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to continue. I'm not sure I'm going to change hosts. I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to do because it's a lot of work. <laughs> but it's really kind of fun, you know, that's out there. And just like everything else, we have a unhinged site, LinkedIn. We have a faceless book site. Facebook, and we have essentially a bird dropping site, Twitter. <laughs> yes, we do use those. I was trying to be a little comical in the beginning of our, of our presentation, you know, that's there. And if you want, of course, speak with me directly, uh, the easiest website uh, I have is sam at eacoe.org. And again, if you send me a note, you want to do a, you know, a conversation, meaning like talking, I'd be more than happy to do that too. And of course, the other thing that we do is the consulting side of our business, and we can talk about mentoring, we can talk about full development with you, we can talk about transforming of, of knowledge through, if I use the phrase, the old apprenticeship model, where we do the first architecture, you and I do the second architecture, our organization and you do the second architecture, and the third one, you the bird flies out of the nest and you're successful there. Lots of different um, concepts that are there. We have a virtual EA service that's on demand that says, you know, let me take a look at this stuff. I don't need somebody uh, to guide me every day, but every once in a while I like to get some level checks that are out there. So I thank all of you for taking the precious time that you have uh, to essentially listen to 
what we consider to be the standard out there for enterprise architecture. And it's not a generalized tool that people think is, is, is popular just because it's popular, but a very specialized tool to produce real enterprise architectures for enterprises that human beings can understand and also the technology specialist. For Dana Bear and myself, thank you for listening. This has been recorded. Um, uh, any of you that have uh, joined us, uh, not a problem. We'll be more than happy to send you a, a, a link to this if you're interested. I thank you again for your time. Please enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on your time zone. And if we can assist you in your enterprise architecture activities, please do not hesitate to contact us. So with that, always being sensitive to people's time, nobody gets yelled at if you end a little bit early. Everybody has a problem if we end a little late. I want to thank you again, and hopefully you'll join me on other upcoming seminars or on my radio show. Once again, Thank you very much. We appreciate your time.